Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Janet Anderson, the Commissioner of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting around Australia uh, and paying my respects to elders past and present, and also to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are actually participating in this webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about the Serious Incident Response Scheme, or SERS, in home services, and specifically how to report under the scheme. We're also going to talk about SERS in relation to people living with cognitive impairment or dementia who are receiving uh, services in the home. Now, the Parliament has just passed legislation which uh, extends the SERS scheme uh, into home services from the 1st of December. And I'm assuming if you're watching this webinar, you already know that. It includes home care package providers, uh, providers of short-term restorative care at home, Commonwealth Home Support Program services, National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flexible aged care services, multi-purpose services, and transition care program services. Now that's a long list, but if you're watching this, this, uh, this webinar, you'll know where you are in that list. The exposure draft of the subordinate legislation, which is the detail about SERS, uh, has been released and I commend it to you. Uh, it absolutely is compulsory reading, along with the draft guidelines that my commission has published. Uh, they have draft on them. That draft stamp will be removed immediately. The subordinate legislation is finalised and we're expecting that to happen very shortly. Now, this is the third webinar of in our series on uh, serious incident response scheme in home services. The first one back in September focused on incident management systems and their link to SERS. The second one in November, earlier November, uh, shone a spotlight on the eight serious incident response scheme reportable incidents uh, and also gave the perspective of working under SERS from a residential aged care and a home services uh, point of view. Uh, recordings for both of those webinars is available uh, from our website, so please go there if you missed either of them. Today I'm very pleased to be joined by three speakers who are going to step us through the content for this webinar. Catherine Keener is a Senior Director in the Commission, uh, and she's going to talk about reporting under SERS. Uh, Jade Austin is from the Department of Health, and she will be talking about the My Age Care Portal and how reporting is done through the portal. And then to round off the trio, we have Leanne Emerson from Dementia Australia, who will be talking to us about SERS for people with cognitive impairment or dementia who, who receive services at home. Now, there will be time at the end for the panellists to take questions. Uh, and we did receive some pre-submitted questions. Thank you to all who, who put questions to us beforehand. There is also an opportunity for you to put questions to us during the webinar. Uh, and any we don't get to, uh, we will publish in a Q&A form uh, on our website afterwards. But without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker. Um, Catherine Keener is, as I say, Senior Director of the Serious Incident <coughs> Team in the Commission. And Catherine's going to give a brief recap of the eight reportable incidents under SERS. And then she's going to touch on the way in which notifications are submitted. Catherine. Thank you, Janet. I'm pleased to share advice from the Department of Health and Aged Care that the draft subordinate legislation of SERS for home services is close to being finalised now that the consultation period has closed. Subordinate legislation is a form of legislation that sits under an Act of Parliament and typically it includes more details about what is required to comply with the Act. Once the legislative process is finalised, the Commission will be able to review our SERS for Home Services resource materials to ensure that they align with the final requirements. Until that time, you should be reading the information in our draft guidelines on the SERS for Home Services providers, which is now available on our website at agedcarequality.gov.au forward slash reforms. What I'd like to do now is uh, give a little bit of a brief recap of the eight reportable incident types. Those of you who have looked at the draft guidance or watched the most recent SERS webinar will be well aware of the similarities and differences between SERS in-home services and SERS in residential care. 
By way of recap, the five reportable incident types that are defined in exactly the same way for both residential care and home services are unlawful sexual contact or inappropriate sexual conduct, unreasonable use of force, psychological or emotional abuse, neglect, and stealing or financial coercion by a staff member. The remaining three types of incidents you might recall are the ones that differ for home services compared with how the SERS operates in a residential care setting. These are unexpected death, missing consumers, and inappropriate use of restrictive practices. An explanation of how these three incident types differ was included in our previous SERS reportable incidents webinar, which you can watch on our YouTube channel. Now, let's consider how providers submit a notification. Some of you uh, from the residential aged care setting will already be well familiar with um, reporting, but for some of you on this particular webinar, this is going to be quite new. All aged care providers must have an incident management system, an IMS, and as part of that, you must establish procedures to identify, manage and resolve incidents. You should also document the roles and responsibilities of staff to follow these procedures and to prevent incidents from occurring. To report a serious incident, your organisation must be registered to access the Department of Health and Aged Care's My Aged Care Service and Support Portal. The department provides access for one administrator in each organisation, and those administrators in turn need to set up access for additional staff to submit notifications. We're now going to move to a demonstration of how to begin using the portal. Back to you, Janet. All right. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Uh, my role here is, is, is by way of segue, very useful introduction, Catherine, to the next segment, um, which, as you say, is a practical demonstration of how to use the My Age Care portal. Um, and I'm going to invite Jade Austin from the Department of Health and Age, uh, Age Care uh, to talk us through this and then lead us into a series of very short videos which provide you with a very useful guide as to what you need to do. Jade, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yes, so I'm Jade from the Strengthening Providers Branch within the Department of Health and Aged Care. The department manages the My Aged Care portal, which is used by providers for various functions and will also be used to submit a SERS notification form, which is then received by the commission. So the SERS notification form will appear in the portal on 1 December 2022 for in-home care providers. Today, we will provide a brief video demonstration on the SERS notification form for in-home care. The video will show you what the notification form looks like and talk you through the process for creating and submitting a SERS notice. We will pause during the video to answer questions that have been raised. The department has also developed a user guide, which is available on the department's website and the link will be circulated after the webinar. Let's now turn to the first segment of the video. Hello everyone, as you have uh, no doubt uh, worked out for yourselves, we're experiencing some technical difficulties with our videos, which is a real shame because we had three lined up for you, uh, each of them designed to, to give you information about the ways in which you would access the My Aged Care portal. It really doesn't matter though, because uh, we can make those videos available to you online uh, and you won't miss out on anything. What I'm going to do instead of uh, running those videos is to uh, go back to Catherine Keener. Um, she has some important tips and tricks about reporting uh, and also a, a few things to say about the subcontractor uh, arrangements and, and whether that is in scope for SERS. So Catherine, how about you pick it up from here? Thank you. Thanks, Janet. I think we'll kick off with the subcontractor issue. As you may recall from the last webinar, Anne Wunsch talked about this particular hot topic. And even if you've engaged another organisation or worker to deliver some or all of a consumer's care and services, you as the provider remain responsible for ensuring the delivery of safe and quality care and services to meet your wellbeing, your SERS responsibilities. I also want to have a bit of a talk about why it's important to report, quality of reporting, and let's talk about some tips too. It's important to keep in mind that when a provider supplies clear and comprehensive information early on, 
it's less likely that the Commission will need to ask for further details or require the provider to conduct an investigation or in some cases directly investigate the matter itself. I'd now like to focus on some of the details often missed when a um, notice is reported. So these include not providing enough detail about an incident, not providing an explanation or rationale when assessing the incident and the impact or harm to the consumer, and not explaining what actions are being taken to minimise the risk of the incident occurring again. We understand that you won't always have all of the necessary information available to you within the first 24 hours when you're submitting a Priority 1 or a P1 notice, but your notifications should still include as much detail as possible about what happened, what steps you've taken to ensure the immediate safety, health and wellbeing of the affected consumer, and also what else you plan to do to assess the causes of and plan your overall response to the incident. Make sure that you include enough information so that a person who wasn't there can understand what happened. It's important to remember too, that once you submit the SERS notification, you can't go back in to edit it and resubmit it. Okay, um, Catherine, I have a question for you that's come in. Marnie has asked, um, how does the 24 hour reporting timeline work for services who provide care outside business hours? That's a really great question. Essentially, your reporting period is 24 hours for a P1 notice and 30 days for a Priority 1 or a P2 notification. What I think we really need to talk about here is that regardless of the day of the week, you're still obliged to make a report within those timeframes. But I think the key issue we need to recognise here is that um, you must report the incident when you become aware of it. So we acknowledge that um, a provider may not become aware of an incident occurring for some time after the incident, but once um, a provider is made aware of the incident, those reporting obligations apply. Okay. Um, I have another question which takes us into uh, what we are going to cover after the next video. Now, the, the 24 hour period for a priority one uh, is not the only notification that we or report that we would be looking for. Uh, there is also a five day reporting window. Can you just elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Oftentimes because oftentimes because there is not enough information available during that first 24 hours of reporting, there may be a need to provide further information to complete a notification or indeed significant information may become available at a later date that you need to notify the Commission of. So what's really important here is that providers understand that they must provide that information to the Commission within five days of reporting, complete your notice and provide all information to us. Um, and similarly, if you become aware of significant other information um, during the course of investigating the incident or um, some other issue comes up, you must notify the Commission in relation to that. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to recap something you said slightly earlier. Um, this, this concept of, of completing a notification, it's key, isn't it? It, it enables us at the Commission to understand how the provider has appreciated the incident and what actions they've taken. Just want to give us a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Completion of a notification really enables us to ensure that we've got enough information at the Commission to be able to assess how you've understood the details of the incident and assess the harm and impact on the consumer. Uh, and how you're going to use the information to provide incident management. So that completion is incredibly important for us to be able to carry out our role at the Commission. Okay. Now, one of the videos we were going to show provides details of how a provider or worker can view a SERS notification, how they can edit or delete a draft notification, um, whether they can upload multiple SERS notices at once, uh, and also gives some guidance on um, where they can find further assistance. Is there anything from that that you want to draw out and talk to quickly, or would you prefer us just to leave the video to do its job when we can make that available to webinar participants afterwards? 
I think what I would say in relation to that, um, Janet, is that the it's really important for providers to view those videos after um, this particular session's finished and reach out to us and um, ask further questions by utilising the SIRS uh, phone line and um, email. Yeah, that, that's a good tip. Um, and I would definitely second that. Uh, we've deliberately established this uh, expedited way of contacting the Commission if you have questions. If you're uncertain about what to do, um, give us a bell, give, give us a ring, send us an email, probably better to email, but whatever you want. Uh, because we're aware that uh, for many of you, this is novel. You're uh, unfamiliar with SIRS, uh, particularly if you've, you're only delivering home services. So this is first time round for you. Uh, and we're, we, we are ready to assist you in whatever way we can. Now, now um, Catherine, to, to, uh, to close out this session, I wonder whether you could give us some examples uh, of home services related incidents that would be reportable and then possibly an example or two of an incident that wouldn't be reported, because I think this is a way of illustrating for um, the participants exactly what would be in scope and possibly uh, not subject to the reporting requirements. Thanks, Janet. I can definitely do that. I think um, let's run through a couple of examples that would be reportable. And let's start with an example of unreasonable use of force. Let's consider a scenario where perhaps a personal care worker arrives to assist a consumer to have a shower. And during the episode of care, the consumer is not cooperating with the care worker's instructions. They're perhaps a little bit wriggly, a little bit resistant to having the shower. And the care worker grabs the consumer's arm and uses that um, force to focus that consumer's attention. And in doing so, they bruise um, the arm of the consumer. This is very clearly an incident that's been carried out in connection with the care and services being provided and is a priority one reportable incident. Let's also now think about a neglect scenario. A care worker arrives at a consumer's home and they're assisting with domestic cleaning in line with their agreement. And in this case, perhaps they're cleaning the kitchen floor. The consumer struggles with mobility and perhaps has a mild cognitive impairment and that care worker carries out their duties, cleans the floor, and tells the consumer to not go into the kitchen until the floor dries. So whilst the care worker puts the mop and the bucket away in the laundry, the consumer's gone into the kitchen to make a cup of tea and has slipped on the wet floor, and this has resulted in a fractured wrist. This incident also happened in the connection with care and services and would be reportable as a priority one reportable incident. If we now think about an example that would not be reportable, if we consider the category stealing or financial coercion by a staff member, we know that sometimes providers will receive reports or information about family members who have allegedly stolen money or goods of value from the consumers. And whilst this is not reportable under SIRS, because it's a family member, not the staff member who is um, involved in this incident, we'd expect that providers would record this incident in their incident management system and take any appropriate action outlined in their existing policies and procedures to ensure the safety and the well-being of the consumer. So Janet, that's a couple of examples of um, what would be reportable and one that would not be reportable. Okay, really useful. Um, we've published resources, we've made mention of those a couple of times. Can you just, uh, for, for people's information, just mention again um, the, the, the number that they can ring uh, or uh, indeed the email line. We can make this available to everyone who's registered after the webinar, but just say it out loud so people have it, uh, that they, you know, they have a pen handy. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to also remind everybody we've got the draft guidelines for providers currently on the Commission's website and we really want to encourage you to call and speak to our team here. So call us for free 1800 081 549. We're here Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and we're even available on the weekend Saturday and Sunday 8.30 to 5pm. You can also reach out to us, as Janet mentioned, via email, and that's at sirs at agecarequality.gov.au.
Thanks, Jen. All right. Well done. And I've also managed to confirm that we will send the links to the videos via email to everyone who's registered for this webinar. So you don't even have to go and look for them. Uh, we'll make sure that you get an email with the link so you can have a quick look at them uh, at, in your own time. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, particularly, and also Jade. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I actually think that is a really useful, practical introduction to some of the detailed um, operational machinery of surge in home services. Uh, and as Catherine said, there's, there's more to be learned through the guidance that we've published in the videos that you can watch separately. Um, very keen to get your feedback on this webinar, including uh, that you may have been disappointed not to see the videos uh, as we had hoped to show them. But we are nonetheless uh, always keen to get your feedback because we're very interested in continuous improvement and learning from these exercises about how we can uh, assist you uh, in being a better provider. So um, at the end of, of the webinar, if you want to click on the yellow speech bubble icon, um, you will bring uh, uh, to vision the a very short survey. We'd love you to complete it. It will actually pop up automatically if you wait till the very end of the webinar. You can do it before we get there if you want. Uh, and just give us your feedback on the webinar and what you liked or, or what could have been done better to suit you. Another reminder also, we're getting some really good questions in. There is the opportunity for you to submit questions as we go, and we will have time at the end to, to take as many of them as possible. So keep them coming. Now, I'd like to move on to the, the third speaker. Leanne Emerson is the Executive Director of Services at uh, Dementia Australia. Now, Leanne's going to talk about um, home services for people living with, with dementia and SIRS in that context, and also, of course, the importance of person-centred care. Thank you, Leanne. Thanks, Janet. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and to our shared futures. Um, it won't come as any surprise to this audience that dementia is one of the largest health and social challenges facing Australia and indeed the world. In 2022, there are just shy of half a million Australians living with dementia and approximately 65% of those live in the community. We know that without a medical breakthrough, the number of people with dementia is going to uh, increase to almost 1.1 million by 2056. As you know, the Royal Commission into Age Quality and Safety reported that 80% of older Australians want to remain living in their homes, uh, in their current home, and 62% of those want to receive community-based aged care services. So home-based aged care services support people living with dementia and their families to continue to do that for longer. Um, and it continues to provide uh, really important uh, support and uh, enable older people to remain autonomous for as long as possible. This makes a substantial difference, not only to the lives of people living with dementia, but also to their families and carers, as well as the broader community. And our experience has shown that early intervention and supports are crucial in enabling people to stay in the community and avoid premature entry into residential aged care. We also know that Australians have the right to live a, to, a lot, to live a life free from abuse and neglect. And people with dementia can be specifically vulnerable to some of those things. Data on occurrence of adverse incidents in home-based care is somewhat limited, but given the shared vulnerabilities with recipients of residential aged care, it's reasonable to assume that people living with dementia receiving care in the home are more vulnerable to experiencing more adverse events than participants with no cognitive impairment. The expansions of SIRS to in-home care and services uh, will provide a much needed safeguard mechanism for people living with dementia, who are one of the most vulnerable groups in our community. One of the most important considerations for providers is ensuring that people with dementia are included in all of the conversations that relate to them. It's really important not to assume that the not to make any assumptions about the capacity of a person living with dementia. Just because someone has dementia, it doesn't necessarily mean that they lack capacity or lack capacity across all areas. Transparency and communication with a person living with dementia and their family is key. In the context of home care, people living with dementia are both vulnerable to incidences happening to them, but in some cases may also be the instigator of a serious incident. And this can kind of create really complex situations. 
as Janet has already uh, spoken about, aged care providers must have appropriate incident management and occupational health and safety systems in place that ensure that those sorts of situations are managed, as well as reducing the likelihood of serious incidents occurring. It's important that any framework follows a human rights-based approach, recognises the dignity and autonomy of people living with dementia and upholds their right to expression. This is where principles of person-centred care are also useful. This involves developing a thorough understanding of the individual person and giving consideration to their cultural background, personal history, social and family networks and preferences for activities in designing their care. The more you know about the person, the more you can plan and be prepared to communicate in a way that's best for them. Knowing the person well means that change behaviours can be picked up early and serious incidences avoided, which of course is the first step that we want to take. Where an incident is outside of SIR's responsibility, it's still important that incidents are managed and reported to the appropriate party. For example, if a care recipient, be that a person with dementia or a carer, has been threatened, harmed, or is in any kind of imminent danger, as care providers, we have a responsibility to do what we can to prevent further harm. If there's an incident between a carer and the person with and the person that they are caring for, while it isn't reportable, while it isn't a reportable incident under SIRS, um, it is likely to be an incident that needs to be reviewed or investigated, managed, documented, future events prevented where possible, and in some instances, uh, other obligations to report to authorities, health professionals, or family members. So I think it's really important to look at how we can prevent and manage uh, incidences both within SIRS where that applies and outside of it. It's also estimated that the prevalence of restrictive practices in home care may be as high as 24.7%. Whilst having robust incident reporting mechanisms are important, preventing serious incidents from occurring should always be the primary goal. And to this end, Dementia Australia believes that all aged care workers must have the necessary education and skills to support people living with dementia that that will not only result in uh, better outcomes for recipients, but also in increased confidence for the workforce and a way to de-escalate and uh, be responsive uh, to incidences as they occur. This includes having a really thorough understanding of change behaviours in people with dementia, how to identify those, how to appropriately communicate with people as their dementia progresses, and that includes understanding nonverbal cues, which I think are key when we're also looking at how to assess what might be a critical incidence, as well as knowing how to report critical incidents to the Commission to support the expansion through in-home care. We know dementia education leads to fewer risk incidences, lower rates of inappropriate use of medication and restrictive practices, and more positive staff attitudes. So we feel very strongly that aged care providers and staff uh, need to start from a place of learning as much as they can and understanding dementia um, so that they're better equipped to continue to support people with dementia. We know from our work and broad consultation with people living with dementia and their families and carers that their view is if we get quality care right for people living with dementia, then we get quality care right for everyone. Thank you. Oh, well done, Leanne. Thank you very much for those insights and uh, really useful way of understanding uh, some of the, the challenges, but also the opportunities, I think, um, that are present for home service workers uh, and providers in delivering first class experiences of, of uh, aged care for um, um, home service recipients. That brings an end to our presentations and it's now time to turn to your questions and gosh, there are a lot of them. So well done you. Um, Catherine, there are a fair few for you, uh, so I'll put you on notice. Um, first one is from Richard. He wants us to clarify, uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the timing of notification and talked about when the provider becomes aware. And what Richard's asked is, is this the staff member in the client's home witnessing the incident or is it when the staff member notifies their line manager? Now, I'm not sure that we would uh, create a, a huge chasm between those two. Would we not expect that a care worker would be in, in, uh, uh, in touch with their employer fairly quickly if they were to observe or an event or an event occurred, an incident occurred? 
Catherine. That's exactly right, um, Janet. We'd expect that providers have um, you know, policies and procedures in place that enable staff to understand their role and responsibility in, in um, reporting serious incidents. To, so we're ensuring that there is uh, not a big chasm, as you suggested, between when that incident occurs and the staff member um, is aware of it and then makes the provider um, or other managers, line managers aware of what has actually happened. So I think um, in terms of the key takeaway here, we're really thinking about are staff trained and do they understand their role and responsibility in relation to SERS reporting? Okay. Um, there's another one here, uh, which I've lost. Uh, I'll need to come back to it. Um, there's a question about volunteers uh, and uh, an individual said that they have a lot of volunteers in their service who visit care recipients in their homes. And what are their reporting responsibilities under SERS? Are they included? Catherine. That's another great question. Um, and we know that within the home services sector, there are a lot of volunteers and um, they play a very important role in care delivery. It's a provider's responsibility to ensure that volunteers within their organisation know how to report a SERS. So um, similarly to the staff question, what we really want to see is that providers have a very clear reporting pathway within their IMS. Um, they communicate that to their volunteers and have a way for volunteers to report a serious incident in a timely way back to the provider to ensure that they then can uh, provide a notification to us at the Commission and undertake their role uh, and responsibility in accordance with their SERS obligations. Okay, another one for you, Catherine. I'm, I'm really lining them up here. Um, if a client has, a, this is from Schmitty, um, if a client has a fall and ends in hospital on the weekend, uh, our services are not there at the time of the fall, do we need to report the incident? That's also another really good question. I think that there's probably a few other questions that might need to be answered to be able to respond to that. But generally what we can say is if a fall happens um, in the absence of care, as in nobody is providing care at the time, you arrive at some point later and a fall has happened, that is not necessarily a, um, a reportable incident. It may be a reportable incident if something happened that was in connection with care and resulted in that fall. But I think what, for the purpose of this conversation, what we're really saying here is um, sometimes incidents happen uh, in somebody's home where care is not being delivered. And in those on those occasions, um, it, it's unlikely they're a, a reportable incident. Okay. And um, Rody's asked about the period for reporting for the, um, the priority two incidents. Um, he thought he, uh, uh, I think it's a he, uh, thought uh, he had 21 days, but uh, it's just clarifying it's 30 days, isn't it? For that's P2? correct. Yeah. 30 yeah. days for P2, that's correct. Okay. And um, you did make mention earlier about uh, this 24 hours, but the, the question is, do weekends and public holidays impact uh, on SERS reporting timeframes? Perhaps we should just be clear about that. Catherine. Absolutely. So incidents that occur on weekends and public holidays, they still need to be reported to the Commission within the correct timeframes. We know that sometimes a provider may not become aware of the incident until some time after that incident occurs, um, and this relates to those uh, previous couple of questions somewhat. But once a provider becomes aware of an incident, they must report it within the Priority 1 and Priority 2 timeframes. Okay. I'm going to give you a break. <laughs> um, Leanne? This notion of impact uh, is, is a really interesting one. And I, and I know that a lot of people talk about the difficulties or the challenges of assessing impact uh, from a serious incident where the individual who has been affected uh, may have some degree of cognitive impairment which affects their, their communication and recall. So I guess what I want to hear from you is what suggestions do you have for aged care workers who are trying to assess impact. They know an incident has occurred or they they strongly suspect something has happened, but they're, they're having to assess impact in order to establish whether it's priority one or priority two. 
Yeah, thanks, Janet. Look, uh, and I think it, it's an interesting kind of situation. It's often not straightforward, but I would also say that, um, as I said when, in my presentation, don't assume to begin with that the person with dementia can't talk to you about what's happened. Sometimes uh, soliciting that information from them may need a different approach and take a little more time. So I would say uh, take the time, first of all, even if they can't give you the full story uh, or all of the detail, they may be able to give you some sense of some pieces of it. And often a person with dementia, even if they can't tell you what happened, they can certainly tell you how they feel. Um, and I think that's a very, uh, a very important cue to look for is where a person with dementia has an emotional reaction to something that seems to be out of character. I think you can also um, garner the information more successfully if you ask close-ended questions. So, for example, um, instead of uh, this doesn't relate to an incident, but instead of asking somebody, how was your day, you might say, did you enjoy your time with Mrs Smith? So you can get a yes or no, you know, a fairly black and white kind of response. Um, I think the other thing to look for is changes in their behaviour or in their mood that might suggest that something has occurred and then inquire uh, about that. I think you need to uh, look for them not wanting to attend previously loved, ac loved activities or reacting differently to people they would normally uh, be comfortable around. Um, and I think the other thing to do, obviously, is look for other physical signs. Um, I think talk to uh, family and others who are involved in the person's care to see if they're picking up anything that appears different or a different impact on the person with dementia. Um, and I think then, you know, the other important thing is to is to consider ongoing observation. You know, even if you don't have the information, you need to determine the priority at that point in time. You know, it's likely that over time that will start to become, that'll be elucidated. So, so take some time and I think communicate the way you approach the person with dementia um, in a way that aids them to be able to communicate most successfully with you has a has a lot to has a lot to do with it. Oh, very wise words. Thank you for that. Um, I, I expect that uh, people will be heading towards your agency uh, for further advice of that ilk because uh, there's a lot to be learned from from that detailed understanding of the ways in which we can still respond in a very person-centered way to each individual uh, irrespective of their of their uh, presenting circumstances leanne another one for you and this is one that uh, marie has asked online and which also came in as a prior question and it's about where a care worker observes something happening that someone else is doing uh, which therefore moves it out of the scope of formal reporting under the Serious Incident Response Scheme, but is nonetheless uh, a troubling practice. So the, the one that's come through from Marie is, uh, what are your thoughts about families who uh, keep their family members with dementia locked inside homes when they're out, but the individual doesn't have to be supervised while they are out? Um, and then the, the one that we received beforehand is, um, what should a carer do if they notice a family member using a restrictive practice with uh, an elderly relative with cognitive impairment, such as keeping them indoors um, or placing their walker out of reach. So what are your thoughts on, A, is it reportable? And my understanding is it's actually outside the, the guidance that we provide in terms of um, incidents occurring in the course of care. Um, but it's nonetheless sufficiently troubling that you wouldn't want to ignore it. So what's your advice? Yes, and actually we have this in our line of work at Dementia Australia, we come across this quite often, um, actually. So, no, I, I don't believe it is reportable through SIRS if it's a behaviour that's happening between uh, family members or, or others that are not um, Commonwealth-funded uh, providers of care. Um, but I would say if you believe that a person with dementia is uh, being neglected or harmed in any way, um, there's still action to be taken. And I think a really good place to start is by contacting OPAN or uh, one of the uh, senior rights organisations across the country who can do a bit more investigating than what you are able to do as a provider, as a rule. But I think the other thing to consider is... Um, Often for family carers, this comes down to a lack of understanding and information about dementia. Um, I think there's some 
uh, easy things that you can suggest to families uh, who may be well intended but not offering the best solution by way of encouraging them to have a have their GP or another health professional review what's going on um, and suggest some other strategies to minimise any kind of real or perceived risk. Um, I think there's also uh, you know a strong argument for. Uh, sending the family and carers in the direction of getting them some information and, and support. And quite often our role is in coaching them, if you like, around other ways of managing whatever their concern is or whatever the behaviour is um, in a way that doesn't move to restrictive practices. So, you know, I think it's not a black and white situation. You need to both be able to address the, the behaviour that's that's not okay, but also, you know, skill the, skill the family carers improve their capacity to be able to manage that situation um, in another way because you know really nine times out of ten it's well-meaning family who just don't know a better way yeah i think uh, further really good advice thank you for that leanne jade i'm getting a lot of questions on the my age care portal so i'm going to come to you with, with some of them to, to start uh, if a provider has never used the My Aged Care portal, and I expect we do have a few of them online, um, how can they get access to it? Janet, thank you. Um, so as mentioned before, so providers will require access to the My Aged Care portal, portal to notify the Commission if a reportable incident occurs. So this is the same portal that providers use to manage information about their services, manage referrals, update client records, generate reports and ask assessors to review a client's support plan. So if there are any providers that still don't have access to the My Aged Care portal, they should contact the My Aged Care Service Provider and Assessor Helpline for assistance. And the number there is 1800 836 799. It's 1800 836 799. So for providers that already have access to the My Aged Care portal, the SERS notification form will appear on 1 December 2022. So the organisation administrator can manage staff access to the portal, including creating accounts and granting staff already on the portal access to the SERS tile. So information about how to provide a staff member with access to the SERS tile is included in the user guide that is now published on the department's website and we'll circulate the link after this webinar as well. Okay. But yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, Jay, there's a, there's a follow-up question in relation to uh, the submission of additional information. Um, Catherine spoke about the, the information which can come in it, within that five-day period after the first notification. And the question's been asked, is that also submitted through the My Age Care portal? Can you answer that? Um, I'll have to take that one on notice. That is a very good question. But okay. I believe there's also there's could be a mechanism where you might direct um, co direct con directly contact the commission. Okay, Catherine, I I don't know where, whether you can answer that. I can, Janet. Uh, that particular um, question is best answered by referring uh, providers to the approve form on our website and on the Department of Health website that encourages or is required, providers are required to utilise, to fill in. Um, it's a form that is gu guides them in terms of what information they need to provide to us, significant use. So it's in a, a format that they can use as a Word document, complete that particular form and then email that to the SERS inbox. So it's actually not uploaded into the My Age Care portal. Any of that additional information will need, need to be completed through the online form, um, saved and then sent through to the SERS inbox um, attached as an email. Okay, that's a, that's a little complicated. Where can people read about that? So the form will be available on the 1st of December, the Home Care Services form. And on, where, either, yeah. on the Department of Health website um, and also on our website. Okay. So if people visit our website and hopefully, and I know it will be well labelled, well, well uh, identified, people can get access to the necessary information and also the, the form that's required to be completed. That's correct. Cool. Okay. 
Catherine, we're still getting questions, or and Leanne actually, but but Catherine, I suspect I'll stay with you. We're still getting questions around uh, what is reportable, and Catherine has come in with uh, a variation on this theme. Um, Catherine has asked uh, whether, uh, in the circumstance where a client reports that their son is stealing vast sums of cash from them, so you have the potential for financial elder abuse. Uh, is that in scope for reporting? If I understand the, the question correctly here, we're talking about the son who yes. has um, is reporting financial abuse but hasn't occurred by the son? No, I beg your pardon. The son is stealing money okay. from the individual, the client, uh, to whom services are being provided. Great. So in that instance that's similar to the uh, non-reportable incident that I talked about before in the sense that stealing or financial coercion by a staff member is certainly uh, well within the scope of the scheme and we would expect uh, providers to report that type of incident but where it's stealing uh, or alleged stealing by a family member we would expect providers to take that up through their existing IMS processes and, and escalate that through pathways that they would already have established uh, for managing financial coercion so referring clients off to um, an appropriate support person uh, or organisation um, or um, advising the consumer of their um, options but certainly having processes themselves in place to manage that, but it's not a reportable incident for SIRS. Okay. Uh, we will probably need to provide some more examples of that uh, on our website because it does seem to be an area where, where people have uh, questions, and understandably so. We do need to uh, offer as much clarity as possible as you've, as you've sought to do in your answer. Um, Jade, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, uh, My Age Care Pool continues to attract a lot of interest. Um, this is a technical question. Uh, are there any plans for My Age Care to release an API for integration with incident management systems to enable automatic report uploads? Thank you. So there are currently no plans in place to incorporate an application programming interface or API for the My Age Care portal, including the SERS dashboard. So as part of the SERS, providers must have their own incident management system in place and the scale of each provider's incident management system will vary across providers to meet their own particular circumstances, as will the software used by providers. So we haven't imposed requirements to use a particular software for the IMS. So incorporating an API poses broader challenges in terms of compatibility, skill sets, and in-house infrastructure and network requirements. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks Jade. Um, a technical answer to a technical question, well done. Um, Catherine, back to you, more questions. Um, and this goes to the eight uh, reportable incident types. A very particular question from Jane. Uh, are all SIRS incidents expected to be reported to police, uh, accepting inappropriate use of restrictive practice? Now, the, the answer is no, uh, but you might want to elaborate on that. That's correct, Janet. Um, not all incidents are reportable to police. Um, and the guidance on our website will be able to give you, we wouldn't have time today to go through each incident type, but I would suggest that you refer to our guidance on the website, which gives clear um, indication of which incidents are reportable to police and in what situations. I think that is, um, the best way to answer that one right now. Yeah, well done. Uh, I do think it, it does require that degree of study. So I do commend people to, again, uh, read up on the rules so that you know exactly what is reportable to police, uh, which is a subset uh, of the issues which are reportable to the Commission. Catherine, a uh, few people have asked, and it's a perfectly reasonable question, what do we do with the SIRS incident reports when we receive them? Thanks, Janet. Um, information that's notified through the SERS, and indeed we use other sources of information um, that the Commission does to inform our regulatory intelligence and data to enable the Commission to more effectively detect and analyse and respond to risks of 
uh, to consumers. Um, our intelligence and data, including SERS reports, informs the Commission's risk profiling of providers and the prioritisation and scope of our monitoring activities as well. We also use that to support the development of sector education, our campaigns, and obviously target regulatory approach, uh, approaches on particular issues as well. Okay. And uh, again, now the guidance that we've spoken about several times now, which is still draft, but which we expect uh, to finalise very shortly, um, that, that's fairly extensive, but what sorts of things can providers find in that document if they, if they access it through our website? Just by way of example. Uh, that's a good question. So um, the, the uh, draft guidance document is going to give you information around responding to incidents, how you assess an incident, uh, your IMS requirements. It's even going to touch on things like continuous improvement, you can find within the guidance information around all eight reportable uh, incident types, how you should assess and classify incidents. It's a really great resource for being able to give you that sort of practical advice around what to do and prepare yourself for the readiness of um, the scheme going live on the 1st of December. There's information around priority one and priority two reporting, uh, the timeframes for reporting, and there's also some troubleshooting in there, frequently asked questions, and more importantly, what is and what isn't um, a particular incident type. So there's great guidance within those, those documents that we've provided um, in draft format already on the website. Wonderful. Last question I'm going to throw to Leanne. Leanne, you get the final say, and I want it to be consumer-centred because you and your organisation excel at that. Um, we've had a number of questions where concerns have been identified about abuse or mistreatment of an individual with dementia where the care worker is observing this happening within a family unit. Um, uh, there are places that uh, specialise in providing advice and support uh, and uh, what would your advice be in terms of referrals uh, where that is being witnessed in a particular home? Yeah, thanks, Janet. Look, what I'd say is, um, you know, this comes up uh, all too often, unfortunately, and I think there's a number of places that as service providers you can go to either get advice about how to manage that or to, in fact, report a concern. Um, a couple of good places to start are with the Older Persons Advocacy Net Network or OPAN, or in fact, our National Dementia Helpline, both of those services can talk through your concerns and try to offer some guidance around how to manage those and where you might go for further support. Um, any one of the senior rights organisations across the country, and they've slightly, uh, got slightly different names state to state, are the best place really to report concerns of elder abuse of any kind, um, including neglect and financial abuse. Um, so I would suggest that maybe call either uh, OPAN or Dementia Australia in the first instance if you want to kind of toss around what, you're, what you believe to be happening and get some uh, help with that. But senior rights is the best place to refer to, I think, once you feel that you have a legitimate concern that needs to be further investigated. Well done. Thank you. So basically, the Serious Incident Response Scheme is one part of a larger whole uh, and we want you to study and understand those reportable incidents that, that must come to the Commission. But equally, uh, it's vital that you have an incident management system and that you have these other services available to you if it doesn't fall within the guidance for reporting under the Serious Incident Response Scheme, but it's nonetheless troubling and you are concerned that that individual uh, need, may need some assistance in, uh, in protecting their rights. That brings us to uh, very close to the end of the webinar. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but we gave it a good try. Um, any questions that we didn't get to, and there are some, we will uh, answer and then put online so that you can uh, have, have your issue addressed. I know there's a lot of change happening in the lead up to the 1st of December and indeed following from the 1st of December, uh, we will continue to support you to learn what you need to learn by providing with guidance and advice. 
Um, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards, and we will send a link to you. We'll also send uh, a link to the videos that we weren't able to see today. My great thanks to Catherine, Jade and Leanne for participating in this webinar and sharing with us all their wisdom. I am sure that you have found it as useful as I did uh, and as informative as we head towards the go live on the 1st of December. Thank you everyone for participating. My apologies again that we weren't able to show you the videos, but the next best thing is that we will send you the link in order that you can watch them. Please stay online and fill out the survey. Give us some feedback on this webinar. Allow us to learn and get better at this all the time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. This presentation provides an overview of the processes for reporting incidents via the Serious Incident Response Scheme tile on the My Aged Care Provider Portal. Access and permissions to report incidents through the portal will depend on your user role. Administrators hold the majority of permissions and can provide staff with access to the SERS portal. This includes providing access to subcontractors and third parties. This is the homepage of the My Aged Care Provider Portal. Administrators can provide employees with appropriate access through the Staff Administration tile to ensure they're assigned an appropriate user role. Steps on this process are available in the reference guide. To create and submit a new incident notice, select the SERS notice tile on the home page and then select Submit New Notice to begin filling out a new SERS notice form. A new tab will open containing imported information regarding the SERS notice. Read this information carefully, then select the Next button to proceed. Complete the relevant information on the Your Details tab. This is one that we have pre-populated with dummy user data for the purpose of this demonstration. Please be sure that you have entered information for each field marked with an asterisk. Once you have finished, navigate to the Incident Details tab by clicking the Next button. This is where we complete the details of the incident. A handy tip. If you are unsure of what is being asked, select the question mark icon for an explainer paragraph. This explainer provides important information about Priority 1 and Priority 2 incidents. For this example, we will make this reportable incident a Priority 1. We have completed the incident details, including who made the allegation, the details of the incident, the incident type, and have provided a detailed description. We can now select Next to complete the People Involved tab. Here we have completed the details of the people involved. The affected care recipient, their level of cognition, the level of psychological impact, the level of physical impact, and the subject of allegation details. You can include up to six subjects of allegation here. When finished this section, select Next to arrive at the Action Taken tab. Here we have completed the details on the actions taken. This incident has been reported to the police, the aged care recipient's representative, their family for example, have been contacted. We have outlined the specific actions taken to ensure the health, safety and well-being of the aged care recipient and specific actions taken to manage or minimise the risk of this reoccurring and we have included some further details in relation to this notice. 
After completing all four tabs of the SERS form, you will be taken to the Review and Submit page. If mandatory information is missing, a red X will appear at the bottom of the relevant page summary. On the Review and Submit page, review the information you have entered. You can navigate back to any tabs requiring edits using the pencil on the right. Once you have finished reviewing the information, select Submit. A confirmation message will be displayed to confirm that the notification is ready for submission. Click Submit to send the notification. The submitted notification can now be viewed in the list of existing notifications. Please note, once a form is submitted, it cannot be retrieved or deleted. Administrators, team leaders and staff members can view existing SERS notices based on their permissions. You can do this by selecting the View and Update Existing Notices tile on the SERS page of the portal. Once you have found the appropriate notice in the table, select the relevant incident ID to view the notice. You can now view and navigate through the draft or submitted notification using the Next button. Administrators, team leaders and staff members can edit or delete SERS notices based on their permissions. Should you wish to edit or delete draft SERS notices, follow the same process to find the draft SERS notice and select the pencil symbol to edit the draft notice or select the bin symbol to delete. A pop-up will appear prompting you to confirm your deletion. Once a notification is deleted, it will not appear anywhere on the portal and cannot be searched for. Organisation and outlet administrators can upload multiple Priority 2 SERS notices at once with the bulk upload function. SERS notices which contain multiple subjects of allegation or Priority 1 incidents cannot be progressed through the bulk upload function. To submit a bulk upload, select the Bulk Upload tile on the SERS page. Bulk uploads need to conform to a specific template in order to be valid. Once you have completed the template, upload the file to the Bulk Upload page. This is an example that we pre-populated. Once you commence the upload of the file, processing of the file will begin as indicated by the processing status in the table. Once the status changes to processed or processed with errors, select the magnifying glass symbol to view the upload details. An upload validation page will be displayed listing the SERS notices uploaded from the template. Each notice contained within the bulk upload will be listed in a separate row. Notices with a ready for submission status contain no errors and can be submitted immediately by selecting the paper airplane symbol on the right hand side of the notice. You can also submit all notices which are ready for submission by selecting the submit all valid reports button. Notices with an action required status possess errors and must be edited before submission. To edit a draft notice, Select the pencil symbol on the right hand side of the notice. The system automatically uploads these into the form, so you can easily progress through the form to see where the errors are and make the appropriate amendments.